Well, hi, everybody, and thanks very much for joining our fifth podcast for the NASA Biologic Space. Um, I'm, I'm uh, very pleased to be again joined by my co-host, uh, Dr. Zori Busser from um, the Girling Institute and NYU. And uh, maybe, Zori, could you maybe do again do a brief little intro of yourself? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. As Mark said, we are really glad uh, that uh, we are coming to our fifth episode of podcast and hopefully this will uh, conclude and help you understand where we stand with regenerative uh, therapies for intervertebral disc. Uh, my name is Zori Booster. As Mark uh, said, I'm a director of research in regenerative medicine here at Girling Institute and also an assistant professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at NYU. Great, and uh, I'm Mark Irwin. I'm a assistant professor in divisions of uh, neurological orthopedic surgery at the University of Toronto. Uh, and uh, as full disclosure, I'm the chief science officer of a novel biotech company. And we're looking to commercialize a, um, a new uh, regenerative therapeutic to treat disc disease. And we may talk about that a bit later on. But that's the, 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 uh, the main focus for today's uh, uh, podcast is to really to try to zero in on biologic therapy for the disc and what have we accomplished and what, what's, what's still missing. You know, why hasn't we made significant progress so far? And, you know, that we have, it's actually a bit misleading to say that because we have made progress. It's just that nothing's really translated to mainstream yet. There's all kinds of interventions actively being investigated, some in various phases of human trials, some still in preclinical work. Um, but the question really is, you know, we're facing with this hostile environment in the disc, and a lot is still not known about what happens in that disc. As, as our previous podcast talked about, we have difficulties posed by the actual milieu of the disc, pro-catabolic, low pH, low perfusion, hypoxic environment. Then we have questions of what the end plates contribute to this whole degenerative cascade and process and how do they interact? We don't really know uh, that well yet. There are more information is coming, but it's still a bit of a slow process. And I guess, you know, we need to consider how any therapy would affect the cell extracellular matrix integration and how, to, how does one affect the other and so forth. And, and also our, our biological therapy definitions maybe require a little bit of explanation. Like we have protein-based, we have cell-based, maybe we have body-derived substances like, like PRP, for example, and perhaps we have ECM kind of engineered matrices with some other method of of of, uh, of introduction to disk space. So the question is like, what are the targets? Is it target the disk nucleus itself? Is it target the annulus? Is it the end plate? Is it all three? How do you do that? And, and what if you try to do any, any of all of the above, how? Is it best to do a direct injection into the disk? And if you do, how do you avoid downstream disk degeneration? Should it be in, some, whatever the intervention is, should it be in some kind of slow release formulation? Is it possible to have a systemic delivery? All these questions need to be addressed when you're discuss, discussing the potential for biologic therapy to be successful. So with that, maybe I'll ask Zora to comment about protein and non-cellular therapies and what what does she what do you think is going on here, Zori? Thanks, Mark. So you really uh, well summarized and what we have to always keep in mind when it comes to this regenerative irrespective if it's end plate, annulus, nucleus, we always have to start with the in vitro and animal models that don't necessarily translate when we get to a clinical trials. And that's a huge obstacle. And I just want to mention that um, disc cells in animal models have a very different metabolism and they can produce much more matrix. So when we inject, and I will go, and that's really important with protein-based therapies, when they get that boost, we can see that restoration, I won't say regeneration, but potentially of this kind that then we fail to see in uh, human and patients and clinical trials. So when we discuss this to your point, we always have to adjust our expectations. Where we stand, so in the last couple of decades, obviously focus was scaffolds, and then move to the cells. And then in the last decade, also growth factors. In a, a pre-clinical setting, there were various growth factors from BMPs that were successful in spinal fusion, tested in the disc. It didn't necessarily always go well. Sometimes there was a bone formation, especially in the outer rib, 
And that actually happened with some of the cell studies as well, with stem cells, because they are uh, undifferentiated. And they, if there is leakage towards the end plates, uh, there were actually some studies that showed osteophytes. So we have to be careful on that end. But in the last, if we were to capture where we stand clinically, uh, in the last at least five to seven years, it was definitely PRP that has been extensively studied. And I believe if we zero it in further down on low back pain, there are over five clinical trials. Uh, some of them are completed. So it will be interesting to see the results. The challenge with PRP is that uh, it's really concentrated uh, growth factors if we were to simplify, it. but there are also some blood residues still in there. So while disc is avascular, as a healthy disc and it's forgiving, so to speak, uh, to what we inject that changes during degeneration. So uh, the question stays in at least the preliminary PRP data uh, for uh, low back pain, it does show reduction in inflammation, but there is no radiological hard evidence that shows where we stand. Okay, is there an improvement in disc height? And we have to be realistic. Some of the stats show that for cells, and we will go into that later, would take a couple of decades to restore third of the disc. So uh, certainly I think with PRP, people are trying to zero down the protocol. How, what kind of PRP would be beneficial for this if it does work? And uh, really boils down to that protocol and how much to inject. So that's, I think, where we stand. And um, very often that knowledge gets transferred from other joints where uh, in sports medicine, people have seen success. But that's a very different environment than this itself. What I find very interesting, and it's coming, uh, there have been um, studies uh, that are hitting that preclinical clinical edge are different types of protein or protein-related therapies. And I would love for you to comment on that a bit further. Sure. Um, it's... Uh... The area is fascinating, right? Because when you look at PR, what, what is PRP? Well, we know they're activated platelets that release growth factors somehow, and then they're injected and you hope it works. It's largely uncharacterized. Nobody really knows what's in there. And there's considerable variability from person to person. A postmenopausal female versus a younger person versus an older guy, everyone's PRP is different. And so it's very difficult to study something like this when you don't know what's actually in it. Uh, it's a kind of grab bag, right, of, of cytokines, and you hope for the best. In many ways, I would argue, and we'll talk about it in a bit, stem cells are kind of like that, too. And that the typical, the most, uh, well, I'll leave it to later, but there's some limitations and, and, and drawbacks with respect to stem cells and knowing what, what they do and how they work. As far as growth factors are concerned, you know, as you mentioned, BMP has been tried, has, has caused, shown some uh, uh, unwanted changes like bone formation and so forth. You know, our group, and I'll be, again, full disclosure, I'm the chief science officer of this new biotech company is trying to commercialize our extensively published work. We, when we looked at, we went, we went way back to developmental biology and like, why is it that mongrel dogs don't get this disease? Beagles, dachshunds, shih tzus, terriers, these so-called chondrostrophic dogs all, virtually always do. Well, one contains notochordal cells in the discs. That's the non chondrostrophic dog. The other ones don't. So we thought, well, maybe they make something. So 23 years later, we figured out the secretome, what these notochordal cells make. And it seems they found out two important growth factors as transforming growth factor beta 1 and connective tissue growth factor, or CCN2, seem to be important players. And we've shown some pretty encouraging preclinical evidence. Now, fortunately, it's not just in rats, because as you know, rats and mice and all their own limitations are very small. Mice have trans annular diffusion, which humans do not. So we did a study looking at three-year-old beagle dogs, and we showed some pretty impressive work. It's published a couple of years ago in scientific reports, where we show not restoration, but maintenance of disc height and things like you're addressing earlier. So we're hopeful that may uh, uh, pan out down the road and trials are we're a ways away from that, but we're working on it. And the, the idea, I think the strength of this approach is it's 
it's kind of a de developmental approach. We didn't just try some growth factor and see what happens. This is, seems to be how the disc works. So we think that that's one avenue. And there are others, of course, out there too. Some people are looking at um, TGF beta inhibitors. Some people suggest that too much TGF beta is a bad idea. That might be true. Um, we've done a lot of work in you know, human disc cells and surgery. And I think I, I make the numbers wrong. I think it's around 30 cases. And we found one that we could find TGF beta. The other ones we couldn't even detect it. So we, we think it's a, it's a deficiency, um, but it may well be a, a necessary and sufficient kind of uh, aspect here. So there's a lot to be said about potential growth factors. And again, should how long do they hang around once they're injected? Mm -hmm. Nobody really knows yet. Um, should they be in a slow release formulation or is too much over too long a bad idea? So these a lot needs to be sorted out before we right, get to kind of the, the gold standard as it were. But so let me ask you this then. We talked about biologic therapies in terms of growth factors, cytokines, PRP, and so forth. Let's get the, let's get back to the kind of the the elephant in the room here, kind of the cell based therapy. You know, stem cells are very sexy to talk about, right? But what kind of cells should you put in there? Um, how do you how do you get in? Do you inject them? I guess how many? Uh, what do they do? Do we have any idea what their function is? And what what might limitations be for cell based therapies? And if you do it once, it seems to help a patient. Can you do it again? Or would the cell debris in there be a problem for the immune system? So, Zori, what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. So, as you said, yes, cell therapies have been around since, I believe, 94. So, we are reaching a third decade that we really focused and studied from animal models and then in the last decade, for sure, into clinical trials. When it comes to cells, obviously, and you mentioned, and we spoke about that through all of our podcasts, we have annulus and nucleus. And I want to say that the majority of preclinical and clinical work is really focusing on that nucleus, the center, uh, to restore. Or I, I sometimes wonder, are we really regenerating or just slowing down, stopping that degeneration and maybe if it's in an early stage it gives a boost to the remaining disc cells to go back to their um, uh, state and continue producing matrix and rebuilding it uh, but what we have to keep in mind even before we dive deeper into what cells is that disc cells again we have to repeat this this is a harsh environment so nucleus pulposa cells are very resilient and they are adapt in the sense that they can change if the pH, oxygen levels, and given that there are barely any nutrients, they can adapt to that. Whereas when we have an influx of cells that don't change that quickly and they were not primed to that environment, that's where a lot of bad can happen. And that's what studies have shown in preclinical setting. And some clinical trials, given that they are not seeing much of a difference, are alluding towards that, that cells just die or go apoptosis and senescence. When it comes to specific cell types, uh, definitely if we would to look, and we've done it in our AO Knowledge Forum, we are really focused on uh, regenerative biologics and osteobiologics, but we've looked at where do we stand clinically now. A lot of cells are bone marrow stem cells. There are a few trials on adipose and then a study or two on disc-like cells, actually that disc, um, using disc-like cells, they just, I believe, finished the two-year uh, follow-up. So it will be interesting to see the actual data, the numbers, where they stand um, and how they compare to stem cells. Most of the stem cells, given that they are bone marrow, they are autologous. Uh, there are only few clinical trials. Actually, I should correct myself. There is only one clinical trial or a case studies. And that's the challenge that we don't have a protocol in the sense, what are the right patients? How many cells? What's been known from the development to your point is that human disc can house around 3 million of cells. The studies, clinical current studies, are injecting, if I'm not mistaken, up to 30 million. So we are seeing this tenfold with the hope that some will survive, but whatever doesn't survive, 
it has that counter effect. And then the big other problem with that, with cells, just for us to keep in mind as we progress, because I think there are some great developments, is do they leak? And rabbits uh, models that are often used for this regeneration just because of the availability and cost uh, uh, show uh, some of the cadaver biomechanical studies that I believe 90% of injected material is lost within the first 30 minutes. So we have to keep in mind when we think, okay, this is the cell type we want to use, how quickly is going to leak the disc, especially if there are annular tears. And do we need a plug at the end of that syringe? So when we inject something to plug, so to say, that annulus or to your point, however we are injecting. And then there is one, I believe, clinical study using umbilical cord stem cells. That's that's a develop, that's a space that it's developing and testing. Maybe this is the better source. Chondrocytes, human chondrocytes have been used. But the problem with chondrocytes, why nasal chondrocytes, there are a few studies on nasal chondrocytes, we can't change them and redirect them to truly be nucleus pulposus. They still produce articular cartilage, and that's not the nucleus we want. Um, so these are really the cells that have been so far used primarily in a clinical setting, which I think matters the most. And but and you mentioned that we always must keep in mind the comorbidities. Are we looking and are we looking at a single level degeneration? And what is that? Fermin grade four definitely is not a good candidate. And how much of a disc height loss are we looking at starting with the therapy? So that really leads to the question, Mark. What are we trying? You mentioned that at the beginning of our today's podcast. Are we trying to fix annulus nucleus? There is end plate. So what if we even fix annulus and nucleus? If there are modic changes and end plate challenges, what if that pro-inflammatory is just seeping in from up and below? So what are your thoughts on that? Like using all those different therapies and corralling them? Well, that's a good point, you know, and, and uh we, I guess it comes back to what are we trying to achieve here? Uh, so people go to the doctor because of back hurts. They don't go because of suppressed collagen type 2 or aggregate. So I think that leads to the next discussion about pain. And, and can these therapies affect pain? One thing that I've not seen uh, in um, preclinical studies in animals using cells, for example, is an assessment of pain. It's very difficult to do that. In mice and uh, maybe rats, you can do facial recognition can't do that uh, in, in dogs. Uh, I don't think you can do it in rabbits either. And so how do you measure if it hurts or not? So I think these are really important things to bear in mind because we're looking at aggregate collagen type 2 and cytokines and uh, disc height. Okay, but a lot of people with disc height's okay in the, back, in the back hurts. So, you know, that's something we looked at recently in, in this therapeutic injection. We looked at neurotrophins and neuropeptides in the annulus. Where we injected the nucleus. We saw a stunning suppression of the, of the expression of these pain-related proteins, but we still don't know if it hurt. It looks like it might have the capacity to suppress pain, but we can't. We don't know. So that's a real limitation, I think, in some of the animal studies that are, that are there. So that's, I think, um, one of the drawbacks or issues in, in doing this. I'm a little conscious of time here. but, but So let me ask you, Zori, so taking it all in, 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 in uh, I guess, from a 30,000 foot view here, what's, what do you think the future holds here? Is there any, is there any hope? I think so. I think I wouldn't look at all the uh, cells and protein therapies that we've done so far as a spine society as a oh, failure. It's not sufficient. We are learning in the uh, process. And as we said, this is very challenging. It's very different than just fusing uh, a level or two. So and so I think these are great steps and I'm excited to see where we are going to be in five years. And where the research is further and from a clinical perspective, really poking interest are homing mechanisms. So instead of really injecting X amount of million cells, uh, there have been uh, teams looking how can we attract stem cells 
or disc-like cells that are existing already around. And what are those signals of degeneration that will trigger them to, uh, to use them as a homing and to get to the disc? So I'm very excited to see how that's going to play out. And also, we didn't touch much about the scaffold, but obviously scaffold is super important, irrespective if you are looking at the cells, at the growth factors. So there have been uh, there has been some work preclinical looking at uh, decellularized matrix, which is so to say disk DBM. So potentially there is maybe something there. That, that can be primed with cells or growth factors and give that biomechanical support as well. Um, so I think a very interesting time ahead of us, uh, but I don't know what do you share the same view or where do you see we can improve further? No, I, th I think you raise a good point. And, and again, I don't want to watch time here, but, but um, a lot of progress has been made. And I think people sometimes mistake failures uh, for more than what they are, because I think you're right. We learn a lot. One of the drawbacks, as you know, uh, is funding uh, for these things. Like to be able to a study like a, the dog study we did, and so that's expensive. And getting the law of funding agencies, and particularly companies, don't want to fund you until you show human clinical data. Well, how do you show human clinical data until you've got the therapeutic? If you're talking about proteins, recombinant proteins and a GMP grade for humans is enormously expensive. You're not going to get that money from peer-reviewed funding sources. So that's one of the limitations I think here is how you fund this kind of work. Uh, but to your point, like there's a lot we need to know. If a protein injected works on viable cells, well, which ones? Mm -hmm. Are they viable nucleus pulposa cells? Are they viable NP cells plus maybe endogenous stem cells? Does, does it, any therapy rescue stem cell activation? Does that work? These are things that are important for us to know better in terms of how to dose appropriately and, and the choice of the, of the if it's a protein, what we use. And if it's the cells, like you said, between three and 30 million, that's a pretty wide uh, 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 range, right? So if you need 30 million to do the job, that strikes me as you're just stuffing something in there until they secrete something good enough before they die off. So. All these are very important limitations, but I, I still think we're making good progress down the road. And as we look at our past work and measure qualitatively, I think, and quantitatively our successes and what seems to work the best, maybe we'll be able to, to make some more measurable uh, uh, gains in the, as, as we go forward. So I guess that's really all we have time for today. Uh, any final thoughts from you, Zori, about this? I I think we'll have to do another podcast in a year or two. And yeah. Maybe so, maybe, maybe so, maybe yeah. so. Okay, well, great. Well, then look, on that, on that note, I guess I'll thank you very much for your help with all of the previous podca podcasts and all of your contributions and everything else. It's been fantastic. It's been a pleasure doing it with you and, and for NASA. And we sure hope that the audience finds it, finds it of interest. And with that, we'll, uh, we'll say goodbye for today. And, and thanks again, everybody, for watching.